going to meet our new panel and I'm very happy to be joined in our Canberra studios by Senator James Patterson who represents the great state of Victoria and here in Melbourne we have gun investigative journalist from the Herald Sun soon to be the European correspondent Stephen Drill. Welcome gentlemen. Uh, let's start with the Medivac bill which has undoubtedly weakened our border protection policies this week and is the first step in dismantling policies that have stopped the boats. James, we are hearing that hundreds of asylum seekers on Manus Island, Nauru, have already obtained recommendations from doctors to be transferred to Australia under this new legislation. That's right, Reda, and there's been a lot of white noise here out of this building in Canberra this week about all the technical aspects of the bill and the nuances and the various conditions that will apply. And it's not just two doctors, it's a panel, and it's just the existing people mm. on Manus and Nauru, it's not new people. I mean, the simple fact and the simple thing that most Australians will grasp and will need to understand is that today our borders are weaker than they were at the beginning of the week, and the result of that will be very, very clear in the months and years ahead. Uh, if you weaken our borders, they will, they will open again and we'll have the floods of people that we had previously. The 50,000 people that came under Rudd and Gillard on 800 boats, uh, the 1,200 people who died at sea, the 17 detention centres that needed to be open, the 8,000 children who ended up in detention. That's the legacy uh, of their last attempt to weaken borders. If we think that this, this attempt to weaken borders is going to be any different, then we're being seriously naive. Well, Stephen... <sighs> I'm struggling to understand why we need to have this emergency evacuation, which is now going to be hundreds, there's not one or two people who need this crisis medical care, when we learned this week that there are 60 medical professionals on Nauru for 420 people. Now, what Australian town has that sort of ratio of medical professionals to, to individuals needing medical care? And when it comes to mental health professionals, uh, there's one for every 14 people on Nauru. I mean, why can't they cope with whatever medical issues they have? And um, because this bill has been sold as a Medivac bill, as, as a medical crisis bill, not as a way to close down offshore pro processing, which is essentially what it is. It does appear to be that way. And it also it seems as if Bill Shorten's having this fight now before the election because he wants to sort of get a, a backwards way of changing his uh, party's policy on asylum seekers mm. before it becomes an election issue. Now, it probably already, already will become an election issue, it might yeah. backfire, but he's trying to appease the left wing of his party who actually did show up a fair bit of support for him. Mm. And now, after the Victorian election, they would have been looking at that result, which was a, a landslide, and thinking, hang on, we really need to stamp our authority now and make sure that we get what we want. So it, it has inadvertently opened up a, a Do you line think attack. that's a miscalculation, though? Because uh, if the coalition is, has any competency at all and they can argue this case, that, that, yeah. they can really expose Labor's weakness because there's a history of, of weakness in that policy area. Um, so wouldn't it have been better to just wait a few months until you're in government and then you can make whatever changes you like without undermining your election? Or are they so far ahead they're not even fearful? I think they think they're so far ahead <laughs> yeah. and they just don't care. I mean, Chris Bowen said a couple of weeks ago, if you don't like our changes to superannuation franking credits, don't vote for us. That's true. So, uh, I mean, they're probably already thinking it doesn't matter, we, we'll lose um, Queensland, mm. but they're confident, say, Victoria might go their way. Yeah, I think, I think you're yeah, right. One they, vote. I, well, I mean, they, they, well, they lost their first vote in the House of Reps in, since 1929 by the government, so yeah. uh, it's given them a bit, of a, a bit of a jump start, but they're still on the, uh, on the, on the resuscitation table. Well, I don't know. I just think um, they're so cocky because they are so far ahead. I guess they can afford to be um, and you can sort of show your hand as opposed to in the past we were told, you know, we'll just tell the electorate what they want to hear and when we get in we'll change things. The, the but core of non-core promises. That's it. They've given us a glimpse of what's to come. So if you still vote for them, you know what you're getting. Uh, now let's talk about something that deserves far greater attention, the plight of Indigenous kids in the Northern Territory and in other communities across the country. Today marks one year since the horrific rape of a two-year-old girl in Tennant Creek. The NT News reports today that there is a report of a Territory child being neglected, sexually exploited or abused every 21 minutes on average. That's just in the Northern Territory. Uh, James, I just find all these figures so shameful. I think this is the biggest 
crisis, genuine crisis facing our country, and yet we have so little debate about it. It's almost taboo to mention these sort of issues. Uh, what can we do to actually save these kids? Well, it's been a profoundly disturbing couple of weeks uh, in this area, Rita. You would have also been aware of the WA coroner's report into the death, or death of, or the self-inflicted deaths of 12 young uh, people uh, in the Kimberley yes. region. Uh, and, and I mean, it, it's hard to even fathom, you know, how in a in a prosperous, wealthy society like Australia that that even still happens, but it does. And the reality is, it's happening particularly in our remote Indigenous communities, and there's a profound issues there. We also had this week the release of the Closing the Gap report by the Prime Minister, which is now in its 11th year. And yet again, while some progress has been made um, on most of the recommendations, uh, most of the targets, uh, progress is not being made anywhere near fast enough to achieve them. Uh, frankly, it needs a reset, uh, and the Prime Minister said that this week. Um, it's going back to COAG to be um, redone from the beginning from the ground up because although it might be a good idea to have an annual report and measurable targets, the, our failure to achieve them for 11 years demonstrates that um, the targets we set for ourselves 11 years ago uh, were not done in the right way and not in a realistic way. No, and I've got to say, Stephen, um, I'm so dis disheartened by the, the entire culture around this, this abuse because even child protection authorities, we know, are so preoccupied with fears of appearing racist or creating another stolen generation that they are leaving children in circumstances that they should not be left with. And if they weren't Indigenous, they probably wouldn't be left with. And to me, that is pure, genuine racism. If you, we would save them if they're white kids and you're not saving them if they're Indigenous kids, then there is something terribly wrong. It's a real dilemma, and I was listening to a, a report about this on the ABC earlier in the week, and uh, one of the first things that, that was picked up by the commentator was that, oh, they'd mentioned uh, the, the death uh, of a six-year-old child and wondered if the Prime Minister had asked with the family if it was OK to raise that. And I think that raises a serious issue, that they were sort of telling the Prime Minister off for actually... Yeah talking and tackling this issue and it, it is... The a, ABC, a, it's, I'm not surprised. It's a reverse racism in, in a way and I don't think we have an answer um, because there is a tyranny of distance involved in this and I think any person who was living in communities four, five, six hundred k's away from decent medical care would have issues but who are the people who can actually get there, there to work in these communities and, and I don't know if there's enough. Well, we, we do devote billions of dollars every year to, to, to solving this. So it's not lack of resources, but there is this, like you mentioned, that reaction from the ABC. It's almost taboo to talk about this. We saw the reaction just a couple of weeks ago when Kerry-Ann Kennelly raised this in relation to the Australia Day protest about what about the rates of abuse. And of course, she was branded a racist. That's, that seems to be the reaction from a lot of the activist class, that merely raising this makes you a racist. Caring about it makes you a racist. So how can we ever even uh, get you close to solving it if we can't even raise it as an issue. But you can't. You can't solve this problem unless you actually deal with it and accept it. But you're not going to be able to be in that position if you don't, can't even talk about it. And when you've got people in positions of power so obsessed with the appearance of being racist or creating another stolen generation that it's affecting their decision making and they're not doing what's in the best interest of the child, then that is part of the problem. It's this entire culture of don't talk about it and we need to talk about it. It's the biggest crisis facing our country. Now let's move on to a, a piece today from the Herald Sun. It's a must read piece from Ed Gannon on the devastating floods in northwest Queensland that are barely getting any coverage. We've heard plenty about the Townsville floods but further inland there are around 500,000 cattle that have perished. Some of those that are left are so shell-shocked that they're incapable of eating or drinking and they're starving. Um, the scale of the devastation is really hard to f fathom, James. Uh, what is the government doing about this? Well, it's a human catastrophe. It's a, nat a natural catastrophe. It's a disaster. Um, Rita, the Prime Minister, as you saw in the package earlier, just before we came on air, um, was, was in Cloncurry today to visit some of the farmers who were affected. And as you say, hundreds of thousands of cattle have perished in the floods uh, and are now present actually quite a serious hazard uh, and need to be cleaned up. So it's a very big task. Um, of which the government is going to shoulder a very significant burden. So there's direct financial assistance to the farmers to help them uh, get through this difficult period. 
Um, the federal government would be involved in directly in the cleanup, uh, working with the Queensland state government because of the, um, the potential biohazard that this poses. Uh, and so we, we are all hands on deck. Um, uh, the PM was there personally today to signal his commitment and, and how seriously he's taking this issue. Now, what can the government do to apply a little bit, pre little bit of pressure on the banks? Because from what I understand, a lot of these uh, farming communities have heavy debts. They've had years of drought before this flood and they've had to go into debt just to keep their businesses and properties going. And now some of them have had their entire business wiped out. All their cattle have died and yet the debt remains. So that the, the pressure and the stress that would be causing them at this time would be enormous. Can the government do anything to, to influence the banks to just show a little bit of compassion whilst um, these people get, try to get their lives back together? Well, you're right, Rita. These people have had a shocking run of luck in recent years. If it's not drought, it's flood, and um, what a difficult way to, to run a farm, run a business. Um, mm. the, the truth is actually that the banks do have good hardship policies. A lot of them already have those policies in place and they are not evil people and they're not going to foreclose on people's farms because of, uh, in instances like this. Um, but one of the recommendations of the Royal Commission uh, was that in times of extreme weather, including drought, that uh, interest payments should be paused um, and that you know, generous assistance should be extended by the banks directly mm. to these farmers, not just by government. Government is generous too, but the banks need to be as well. And I think particularly in the wake of the Royal Commission, no one needs to tell the banks uh, any more clearly than they've already heard it, um, that they need to be very sensitive in dealing with these people. Well, let's hope they've heard it because the banks have a history of hearing things and then forgetting them as just, just, just when it the becomes convenient, memory. yes. Um, uh, now, are you surprised, uh, uh, Stephen, that this isn't getting the sort of coverage you would expect given the scale of the devastation? You're talking about 500,000 heads of cattle gone, each one of them worth around $1,000. You know, it is really such a significant loss and also wildlife in that area, all sorts of uh, animals destroyed. Um, again, do you think it's just the distance that... I think it is the of distance. That, we don't it's hear a matter it? of actually trying to get people to go and cover that and, and get the Isn't images. that why we have the ABC? Isn't that why we fund them to the tune of more than a billion dollars a year so they can actually be in these areas where commercial operators don't go? Yeah, I mean, there has been floods, though, so to, some of these places would be difficult to access and they're not... It's helicopters the... and planes, you know. You, you, can't, <laughs> you, you can get there. Do they have a helicopter? They're allowed to? <laughs> yeah, they've got helicopters. Well, I've but, seen plenty. I think if, we, if it's sort of outside the CBD of Sydney or CBD of Melbourne, there's probably not enough um, attention on it. And also, I don't think Australians actually understand and realise how important farmers are to our economy. It's one of our great strengths uh, and we really should be uh, advancing that area, not not just sort of yeah. letting these farmers suffer because without that, what, what, what are we going to be in 50 years? Like, yeah. that, you know, that is, we've got land and we should be making that a, a pillar of our economy. Absolutely. Now let's go to Melbourne where earlier this week a court heard Saeed Nuri, who ploughed into pedestrians at a busy intersection in Melbourne, said that he did it in the name of Allah. Nuri, an Islamic State sympathiser, repeatedly said Alu Akbar at the scene of the crime, then complained to police about the treatment of Muslims and ASIO in the hours after the attack. And yet, Stephen, no terror charges. This is what I cannot understand. I mean, what do you need to do to be charged with terrorism offences? Well, that's a very important question. I mean, even from reports today, uh, Nuri had said to the police, why no, why no terrorism charges? And they said, well, you know... It, isn't the perpetrator's it, asking the question asking even. The question. Good he Lord. had actually made searches on his computer of other terror attacks and how to drive through people. And he made... One of, the, one of his victim's children who made a statement to the court said exactly the same thing. Why not terrorism charges? This was a terrorist act. And there was no other... Well, there may be other reasons, but this was deliberate. And he actually... In Melbourne, there's tram lines, and which are dedicated for trams and there's actually uh, a raised platform that would stop a car from going onto it. He drove over that um, mm. raised platform, drove on the tram tracks and through one of the busiest pedestrian intersections. If it was, if he was actually, it's only by sheer dumb luck that more people weren't killed. Oh, the, the footage, I do not recommend anyone actually look at it. It is horrific but watching it and watching it, that is such a busy intersection, I cross it most, most days, always busy, and that there weren't more deaths is a true miracle, because you would think when you watch the footage that there would be a dozen people who, who, who perished. James, I, 
I know you can't say much about court matters. He's pleaded guilty. We're awaiting sentencing. But mm. the lack of terror charges in what looks to be a terror case, how do you explain that? Well, the classic definition of terrorism, Rita, is violence motivated by political ends or violence to achieve a political objective. Um, exactly. And on a plain English reading uh, of this instance, that seems pretty persuasive to me. Um, but it might not meet the technical legal uh, definition, and um, I don't have all the facts of the case in front of me, so I can't say that with authority. I think one of the interesting things, though, when these sort of incidents are happening, sadly, with increasing frequency in our um, Western cities, uh, is that there's a rush to kind of define it, in the one hand, as a mental health issue, on the other hand, as a terrorism issue, as if um, it's not possible to be both. Um, and I think, I mean, almost by definition, if you get into a car and drive it into yes. a crowd of people, um, <laughs> there's something seriously mentally wrong about you, and you may well also be um, motivated by Islamist ideology, as this person um, might be too. Absolutely. They're not mutually exclusive, are they? And we've seen that in multiple examples overseas and even here in Australia, that you can be uh, crazy <laughs> and a mm. crazy Islamist. You know, you, you, one doesn't cancel out the other. Now, let's talk housing, where the price crash has seen close to 100 suburbs around the country dropping out of the so-called million dollar club, where the median value of a home is million dollars or more. Some suburbs have seen their median price drop by around 40%. This is a tad alarming, Steve. It is, and a lot of people uh, have their home loans maybe up to 95% or they've got uh, an 80%. 80% is, is very normal. I mean, 80% then you don't have to pay lenders mortgage insurance, but some people borrow more with, with lenders mortgage insurance. So now they owe the bank more Matt, than more the house is worth. And if you own, if you just bought an apartment in the last 12 to 18 months, I'd be very, very worried because uh, this means that investors have really pulled out of the market. Now the banks are saying, oh no, it's not us, we're not restricting lending. Yeah. And, and maybe that's true, we'll probably have to wait six months. Oh, they are restricting out. lending. They um, have made it very difficult for borrowers to borrow um, and for people who've already borrowed to refinance if they don't like their bank. Uh, James, uh, Labor's uh, housing policies, I think they're already having an impact in this area because investors are, are shy about entering the market if they can't resell to investors. Essentially, Labor's policy is going to remove investors from the established market, isn't it? Well, it's Economics 101, Rita. If you take a third of the potential buyers out of a market, uh, which is what mm. investors roughly represent in the market, um, for existing built dwellings, uh, then uh, what's going to happen when the properties go to auction in the future? Well, one third less buyers, it's definitely going to go for less money than it's going for now. So um, if people are anticipating that the Labor Party might win the election and anticipating that they'll introduce this policy, which they've been talking about for a couple of years now, then no doubt that's having an effect on housing prices. And so uh, it doesn't even require an election victory uh, for it to have an impact today. Hmm. Oh, absolutely. And it's not just the, uh, the negative gearing policy. It's also they wanting to substantially increase capital gains tax. So uh, that's a double that's whammy right. for, for investors. Um, these policies were formulated at a time where housing was soaring. It was, it was uh, prices were going up by, you know, big margins every year. But now that the market's gone backwards, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney, do you think Labor will rethink this policy going to the election? Because it seems to be um, foolish, for want of a better word. <laughs> Well, judging by the response that Chris Bowen has made to any other criticisms of his tax policies, probably not, Rita. He uh, seems to be um, not for turning on this, and he's happy to inflict whatever damage necessary to the housing market or uh, the bank balances of self-funded retirees um, that it is required in order to get him the revenue that he wants to then go and splash around and his colleagues want to go splash around. I mean, this is classic Labor. Um, there's $200 billion of tax increases that they've already committed to doing prior to the election. Imagine how much they would actually increase taxes by if they won if that's what they're saying before the election. Imagine all the other plans they have to increase taxes uh, and how, other, how many other people are going to be hurt, whether it's capital gains tax, as you say, income tax, company tax, dividend imputation, the list goes on and on and on. But they would know this would be hurting certain segments of their base because we do know from, from the ABS statistics a large portion of people who negatively gear aren't multimillionaires. They're everyday mums and dads, teachers and, and nurses and, uh, you know, paramedics. They're, they're not on enormous incomes. They're just trying to plan for their retirement. And surely, you know, Labor don't have a death wish. They do want to win the election. Why wouldn't they just step away from this policy? Do you think that there is room for them to, to, to step back and perhaps rethink it, given the current market conditions? 
You're right, Rita. Negative gearing is a feature of the tax system that is primarily taken advantage of by middle income people. Because if you're really wealthy, there's lots of other options for you. But if you're middle class and you want to invest and grow your wealth for yourself and your family, negative gearing has been a really good way of doing that. And we know that when negative gearing was previously abolished under Paul Keating as treasurer, in Sydney in particular, there was a flight of investors out of the housing market and it was rents that went up most spectacularly. Uh, and so Labor should be thinking about the impact on uh, their supporters as well who rent uh, houses and who, who need to stay in the, in the rental market. Um, I don't think it's going to help anyone, Rita, this policy. And I, I, I mean, we will hope and pray that um, that reality gets through to Chris Bowen. But I don't. I'm not going to hold my breath on that actually happening. <laughs> now we're going to go to a break. We've got plenty more to discuss. See you soon. James Patterson in Canberra. Now to Chicago for one of the more bizarre stories of the year, involving what we were told was a heinous racist homophobic attack against actor Jussie Smollett. The Empire star claims two white men brutally attacked him, put his head in a noose and screamed, this is mega country, mega make America great again country. But police have failed to find any evidence of the attack and today they had to push back on media reports that the entire thing was a hoax. And if the anti-Trump actor did report a hoax, he'll be charged along with any co-conspirators. Stephen, this is such a bizarre story. Media are already calling it a hoax. There's been multiple media reports from Variety and a number of other journalists saying the cops are, have, have it finalised their investigation. But the Chicago police have said, no, no, wait a second, we haven't finalised anything yet. But from the very start, this story had a bit of a smell to it. It's a really strange one and it's probably a bit naive. If it is a hoax, well, uh, then he probably hasn't thought it through because you'd imagine there'd be some CCTV around that may or may not uh, prove his There's claim. There's plenty of CCTV of him, uh, none of any attackers or... Well, didn't uh, he come back with his sandwich? Like well, he apparently his sandwich during the, the entire it. attack, he was on the phone to, to his manager or someone who, who he works with and he had a Subway sandwich and he somehow managed to emerge from this vicious attack where he, and I quote, I fought the F back. Uh, he's ho still holding his sandwich and still on the phone. So. How, how, was it toasted or fresh? <laughs> it must have been. if it was toasted, maybe it was used as a button. <laughs> it must have been a good sandwich, James. But there's been a number of, uh, getting away from this, there's been a number of other cases where it's been established that supposed hate crimes were hoaxes and, and the people who have uh, lied have been charged. Uh, I, I do wonder if America is such a racist place and if Trump has ushered in this horrible new era, why are people having to make up these <laughs> alleged crimes? Indeed, Rita. And doesn't this just highlight the, the cancerous nature of identity politics? I mean, people were so willing to believe this story because they wanted it to be true. They wanted to believe it because it fit their pre-existing political narrative and allowed them to hate the political figure that they despise the most, Donald Trump, even more and have even more justification for their hatred. Um, I think it's just a, a real lesson that all of us should be a bit more cautious, a bit more slow to uh, jump to judgment and a little bit more skeptical when we hear about these things. And if they are indeed do prove to be true, then they're very serious and we need to take serious steps to address them. But if they end up that people are taking advantage uh, of us and um, spitting lines, as this may yet prove to be, um, then we should have no time for it all. Absolutely. If there's a genuine racist or homophobic attack, it needs to be condemned and then the guilty prosecuted to the full extent of the law. But if, if, if there are hoaxes, I think it undermines the real victims incredibly. It is such a ridiculous thing to do. And um, well, it's, in this case... Well, it's the Bernie wolf scenario. Absolutely. That's right. When you have a genuine victim, people doubt their story because we've had so many other mm. hoaxes. And in this case, uh, Stephen, um, this is an actor, to give you a bit more background, who's very much anti-Trump, his social media feed, you know, so if, when he came out that in blizzard conditions, these two white supremacists were in a, a neighbourhood that, you know, there aren't too many white supremacists just ready to attack him with, with, a, with a noose, uh, it just seemed 
ridiculous from the start, I've got to say. But we'll see. Maybe, maybe they'll turn up some evidence that it actually happened. Now, let's come back closer to home where Victoria Police will uh, not lay any criminal charges against any of the current Andrews government MPs involved in the $388,000 rorts for vote scandal. The 16 Labor MPs have been exonerated, even though they refused to be interviewed by police. <sighs> Stephen... This, to me, again, uh, I'm continually shocked today. Every single topic I've brought to the table is one that has surprised me, and this is, no this is another one. I just would have thought that if you don't cooperate with the cops, that they don't exonerate you, but obviously I'm naive. Well, I mean, the police... Fraud investigations are notoriously difficult, uh, difficult to I'm prove. not suggesting they're guilty, but no, I'm just no. surprised as politicians serving the public that they would not cooperate with police when asked? Well, I mean, they do have a right to, to uh, not cooperate with police. Often that can make your situation worse for you if you haven't taken up your chance to explain yourself. Not, not but in, in this, this case. In this case, they, they, they've managed to not have their... To, well, presumably not have any fingerprints on any paperwork. Now, there are two people who are still being investigated. One of them is the former politician, John Lenders, mm. who was the architect, we're told, of the whole scheme. So I think the police haven't... Uh, close the book on this one yet, and I would imagine there's still some things to go. But given the uh, high-profile nature of it, it is extraordinary that there have been names of people who are exonerated, because uh, it's unusual that that's the case, that people get cleared uh, oh. for things that they apparently didn't do. No, James, uh, I've got to... This, this case has uh, surprised a lot of people, just given how little... Uh, impact it's had on the Labor government. It really didn't hurt them at the polls. They had a landslide victory. It really didn't damage them to any extent, despite the fact that they were found to be systematically rorting the taxpayer for their own benefit and mm -hmm. had to pay back that money. Uh, before they, had, uh, th they paid back that money, they spent a lot more of that uh, public money trying to bury the report, going to the court, Supreme Court, the Appeals Court, to the High Court, trying to bury it. Um, unsuccessful in the end, and yet they seem to have walked away scot-free. Well, and you've got to wonder, Rita, I mean, what are the consequences? So perhaps their conduct did not meet, as the police say, uh, the criminal threshold required for prosecution, but it certainly left a lot to be desired. And I think they set a very poor example by their failure to cooperate with police. I mean, these are supposed to be leaders in our community, pillars of our community that are supposed to be looked up to by the community. And they're saying it's perfectly fine when the police ask to interview you about a matter of um, a potential uh, breach of the law to just not cooperate, just not participate, not go down to the station for an interview. And in the end, that there appear to be no consequences, not even political consequences for these people involved. So I think that sends a profoundly uh, bad signal. I think it uh, will lead to a further undermining of our political culture uh, and it will lead to this kind of more of this kind of soft political corruption where uh, people push the envelope, people um, do things that they shouldn't do with public money and there's no consequences. And I think that's a very disturbing thing for our democracy. Well, you mentioned political consequences there and that's what's surprising here. Are politicians thought of so badly, Steve, that they're not really punished anymore if they thought caught with their hands in, in the till, which is essentially what this is, because uh, it really didn't seem to matter to the public, not enough to change their vote anyway. Uh, but this wasn't the only um, scandal in the, the four years of the Dan Andrews government before the election. We had Steve Herbert chauffeuring around his dogs in between his parliamentary office and his, and his home. And they we weren't had, cute puppies. They, they were. They were. <laughs> <laughs> Pistol and Boo didn't get the same treatment, though. Um, but there was also the, the speaker who was rorting the, uh, his allowances to $100,000. Oh, yes. So I think... And the billion dollars for the road that was never built. I mean, there's, there's a lot of scandals, but this one's different. This isn't just incompetence. Too... This was uh, dishonesty to such a deep extent. And yet it didn't seem to have an impact. And I think, sadly, that's because... Uh, was it too confusing? Was it too detailed? And people probably just thought, oh, I'm not really sure what, what it actually means. And uh... it, could, it, it could have something to do with that. Now, staying with Victoria Police, I just want to ask you quickly, we have a Royal Commission starting today in, in Melbourne into the Lawyer X scandal, which the Herald Sun exposed. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, it, it has been described as the biggest legal scandal in Australia's history, and uh, that became even clearer today. There's 
uh, up to six people who had uh, responsibilities to protect their clients mm. and they appear to mm. have, have broken those. One of those was Lawyer X, who mm. cannot be named, and one of those was believed to be Joe Aquaro, who was later killed. And mm. that's another matter before the courts. It's For those interstate who are not as familiar with this story, we essentially have a very high-profile defence lawyer who was playing both sides. So she was informing on the clients she was supposed to be defending to the cops, but which completely undermines our justice system and, and the, uh, the, the right you have to a fair defence. If, if the person you know, you've trusted to keep you out of jail is working with the people trying to put you in jail, that's pretty unfair, you've got to say. working in some cases. There were suggestions that this lawyer was going out and telling underlings of the, the underworld figures to go and dob on their mates to actually provide evidence for the police to press charges. And we're not talking about you know, uh, ripping off a milk bar. We're talking about multi-million dollar drug um, uh, importations and also in some cases murders. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, who cares? It's, it's just drug dealers and murderers being punished. But well, you, you can it's you. Absolutely. You think it's drug dealers and murderers today and it could be your loved one who's charged with something tomorrow. You cannot have the justice system completely hijacked in this manner and it may mean that there are drug dealers and murderers who get reduced sentences out of all this at the end at the end uh, once the That's whole catastrophe is sorted with. thought until uh, he was uh, well he's believed he will get out a bit earlier as a result of it. Well, he's out now in hospital, but, yeah, that's, that's probably not <laughs> what he was planning. Uh, now, staying in Victoria, there was a disturbing home invasion in Melbourne, where else, um, that's left a young child deeply traumatised after she woke to find a group of intruders inside her home. Six men of African appearance bashed the girl's father with a golf club, leaving him hospitalised with serious head injuries. They then stole the family's Mercedes-Benz. Um, Steve... <sighs> These crimes, when I speak to people uh, interstate, they say these are Victorian crimes. Is this a problem that's unique to Melbourne or are these violent home invasions happening regularly elsewhere in the country but we only hear about it in Melbourne? No, well, I actually had a, a lunch with the editors in Sydney on Tuesday and they asked me exactly the same question. Why is this in Melbourne? What's going on? Why do you have this problem? And they're saying it doesn't happen there. And, and it, it's really hard to explain. Maybe we've had a group of people who haven't been able to assimilate yet, um, integrate into society perhaps. And, perhaps uh, we've got law enforcement that's a little bit more per permissive than they are interstate. They, 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 you could potentially say that. I mean, they do have the Middle Eastern Crime Gang in uh, Crime Task Force in New South Wales. They're quite active at really trying to stamp out specific problems. So I wonder if that could be the case here. Uh, James, do you think Victoria does have a law and order problem? Clearly we do. I mean, um, although certainly there's crime all across Australia, there's a particular problem in Victoria with aggravated burglaries and assaults, um, with thefts, um, violent thefts, when you see the jewellery shops being smashed up uh, every second week, it seems, in Melbourne. There clearly is something different about Victoria. There clearly is a, a prob unique problem in Victoria, and it's something that the police and the Andrews government have not yet got on top of, despite all the resources that have allegedly been thrown their way. I think part of the problems uh, was the weakening of the bail laws in Victoria. Um, that was a real mistake, um, and, and unfortunately, um, given the result of the state election, um, the, the, op the opposition's policies to really toughen those up and set that back on the, on the straight uh, has not happened, and we're left with the Andrews government, which has been um, really been caught napping on this issue. It has, um, and a lot of the focus has been on, on the police because we do have somewhat of a police service in uh, Victoria as opposed to a police force. Uh, and we have seen multiple instances where there's been rampages and the police have watched and contained a situation, but they have not made arrests, Stephen. And we've had cases from St Kilda to Collingwood to Werribee, Footscray. There's been multiple uh, cases where large groups of youth have gone on a wild rampage. The cops have been there, observed it, but chosen not to make arrests. And to me, that is a big mistake. And a lot of police working at the coalface have issues with it. They think it emboldens the crims and makes the police look weak. Uh, do we need a different approach to our policing in this state? Well, that is a question. I mean, I, I do know that in some cases when the young criminals have been sentenced and they've all got out at the same time and that's mm. been an issue as well. They're sort of going in in waves and then coming out in waves because they haven't received very heavy sentences because of their youth. Yeah. So it's really going to be one that 
is well, I don't think that we've got the answers for it at the, at the moment, and mm. but letting people get away with it is probably uh, not helping. No, no, absolutely. Now let's uh, go to something entirely different. Hollywood actress Brie Larson has vowed to make the press tour for Captain Marvel as inclusive as possible. The fierce gender equality activist, as the Hollywood reporter calls her, wants to save womankind. I've got to say, I didn't know we needed to be saved. Uh, but Brie Larson is very concerned about how white and male movie critics are. She said, about a year ago, I started paying attention to what my press days look like and the critics review me reviewing movies and were overwhelmingly white male, which she has an issue with. Um, Stephen, should we have some sort of quota system for m movie reviewers? Uh, is, is this the solution to Bree's issue? Well, I hope not, because I'll be going to Europe <laughs> in a couple of months and I might hope to do a couple of movie reviews myself, so I might get banned. Um, so you won't be able to do Bree's junkets because no. you absolutely, unless you, I don't know, develop some sort of uh, different lifestyles, in, in um, which will, might surprise your wife, but, yeah, you, you, you are out. You, 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 you've got all the bad markers, white, male, heterosexual. I'm out. But oh, look, it's, a, it's one quick... <laughs> now I'm just walking on time bombs here. Um, <laughs> but, uh, there probably is, um, a certain extent, a, a bias in some sections of the media where there is uh, a lot of men who are probably in more senior positions for other reasons. And, mm. uh, but I don't know if quotas, gonna, quotas are going to be the answer. Well, she picked a, uh, a female woman of colour who also has a disability on purpose to do a, a feature on her. And to me, I don't know, James, I thought that was just so patronising that uh, uh, the woman was probably completely capable, but to pick her because of these characteristics that she has no control over, that sort of identity politics to me is so toxic and, and backward. And we should be just judging people on their character, not what their skin colour or sexual preference is. Look, I agree, Rita, and it would be a breath of fresh air if the people so obsessed with diversity on innate characteristics like race or gender or sexuality were also a bit interested in diversity of opinion and diversity of ideas. Because, <laughs> frankly, no. I think in the media and in the entertainment world, it's a much bigger problem to the lack of diversity of ideas and values and philosophies than it is diversity of innate cri criteria that we have no ability to control ourselves. Absolutely. I'm 100% with you there. And uh, these, these very same people who are obsessed with diversity, I've got to say, the one type of diversity they have no tolerance for is diversity of opinion. And that's whether you're talking about uh, Hollywood or academia or even much of the media. Now, thank you both for joining me. Uh, We've had Senator James Patterson in Canberra and Stephen Drill right here in Melbourne. I'll be back with Sport and Weather right after this.